There are certain things that people can do that I am in awe of, simply because I'm pretty useless at them myself. They seem almost magical to me. Now, one of those things is growing a beautiful garden. And um, just as lockdown is easing, I'm beginning to visit people in their gardens. Um, recently, I visited uh, three members of the congregation in their gardens. And uh, I'm visiting two more this week. Um, if you want to host a visit um, in your garden for me to come have a cup of tea with you or something, get in touch. As I've been looking, though, at these people's gardens, it is amazing what they've done. Now, they've been pretty established gardens, but what they've grown from seed is extraordinary. Fruit and vegetables and flowers, it's beautiful. Now, if you are a gardener, then today's readings will mean a lot to you. Um, both the Old Testament and the New Testament reading talks about two things. First of all, there's the power of the seed itself that locked up in a seed is the extraordinary potential and power for growth and fruitfulness. And there's nothing really that we can add or take away from that. There it is. It's the power of the seed itself to be able to grow and be fruitful and to reproduce. But secondly, what we learn is that in order to be able to unlock that power, to unleash it, to allow it to fill its potential, then the right soil, the right conditions have to be provided and without them the seed can't, can't do its stuff. So first of all then, let's think about the seed itself, that within the seed there is this extraordinary power waiting to be unleashed. Just take a look at these spinach seeds. Both Isaiah and Jesus describe the Word of God as seed, that the Word of God too has locked up within it all that potential for growth and fruitfulness. And, and that seed has been planted in you. It's been planted in you for the first time that you ever heard about God's truth revealed through the words of the Bible. And it's planted in you every week or whenever you turn to the Bible and read something there. God's message to you, God's words to you have been planted um, deep in your heart. And, and there they lie with all of that same extraordinary potential for transformation, for growth, for fulfilment, for fruitfulness. But we also learn through the parable of the sower, or, or perhaps we should call, call it the parable of the soils, because actually the sower is, is, is the same sower. The seed is the same in each of the scenarios that Jesus describes. The only difference in the growth of those seeds and in the fruitfulness of those seeds is the soil in which those seeds 
are planted with four very, very different outcomes. And the question then, I think, that Jesus is asking, he says that the word of God is powerful. It will do its job. As Isaiah says, it, it, it will not return to him empty. There will be um, seed that will produce crops for, for bread, for eating, and for seed for sowing next year's crops, because all of that potential for growth and fruitfulness is locked up within it. It only has to be unleashed, and it needs the right soil. So that seed, which has been planted in you over the years, that seed, in order to bear its fruit, just needs the right soil in order to flourish. And therefore, what we have to do, the responsibility that we have, is to ensure that the soil of our lives is the right kind of soil that will allow that seed to germinate, to grow, and to bear fruit in our lives. What we're talking about here is the environment that we are creating for the Word of God to do its job. And there's very little else that we need to do, actually. We can't make the seed grow. The, grow will, the seed will grow by itself. What we can do and what we have to do is ensure that the soil of our lives is good and rich and appropriate. And that is something that we can do something about. And there are various things that we need to be attentive to in order to be able to create that right environment for our lives to be a hot house for the growth and the fruitfulness of the word of God in our lives. And so we're going to think now about how we might do that. And this is where our New Testament reading is very helpful. Paul describes a difference between what he calls a life of the flesh and, um, and a life of the spirit, a life lived from the flesh and a life lived from the spirit. And when he talks about flesh and spirit, the Greek words that he's using, I mean, they do literally mean flesh and, and spirit, but they're used um, theologically, they're used metaphorically. He's not talking about material things versus non-material things when he talks about the flesh and the spirit. Rather, he's talking about our attitudes. He's talking about the flesh, in, in a sense, as a, as a metaphor for um, a life which is completely unredeemed, a life which has no reference to God, a life which is led um, entirely from um, uh, the kind of the ungodly and selfish desires of the human heart, as opposed to a life which is imbued with the spirit, with the spirit of God, the presence of God, the desire to, to live for God. Um, our Christian faith is, does not make a division in that sense between, the, between material things and immaterial things because uh, the, the incarnation itself shows how, how it is that God has created and redeemed all, all of material reality and our life in the spirit is lived within this material world and so all things have been redeemed for us. Um, and so it's, it's important just to say that and to see that. We're not talking about a life where we suppress anything to do with, with the material world and with the literal flesh. Um, no, this is about our primarily our attitudes, how it is that we're going to be open to God's spirit within the whole fabric, within the whole flow of all of our life, not just the religious bits of our life, but all of our life. How is that going to be watered, fed, imbued with the Spirit of God? And I want to talk about three, three ways that we can make room for the presence of the Spirit of God to water, refresh, feed our lives in order to make the soil of our lives um, a good place for the Word of God to grow and be fruitful in us and to transform us um, into the the, the plant that we have the potential to be. Uh, the first thing um, is, I suppose, time. I, I'm going to talk about, well, let's say, I'm going to talk about time, I'm going to talk about attitudes, and I'm going to talk about culture. So first of all, time. Just quite simply, um, these, are my, these are my three kind of like items on my checklist for myself to see, am I actually being open to God and creating the, the opportunity for God's words to grow and be fruitful in me. And when I, 
when I begin to get these out of balance, and believe me, I do a lot and have to constantly uh, recheck and see how I'm doing and bring myself back to being a good spiritual gardener. The, this, this is my checklist. First of all, what time am I giving to tending the garden of my heart and my life? And, and therefore, I need to be able to create um, space in the time, in the rhythm of my day for certain spiritual practices, effectively. Um, and those spiritual practices are, are, are pretty obvious. One of them is, is prayer. Um, when we can be together, part of that's corporate prayer. That would be the Eucharist would be part of that and Bible studies with others and that kind of thing. Um, but... Um, uh, but there would also be, whether there's a lockdown or not, there would be time for, for personal prayer as well. And personal study of the scriptures. Um, but it isn't just those kinds of religious things. Because it's about the whole of our life. And therefore, I want to be able to give time to, to things which are life-giving and good. I want to make sure that there is in my life time for uh, for relationships good wholesome relationships i want to make sure that there is um, time for creativity because when i'm creative then i am in some way as genesis the first part of first couple of chapters of genesis shows i am actually showing that i am made in the image of god as i draw upon the creativity which is god's gift for me. We all have different ways of being creative, so giving time to that is also important. I need to look after my body, so physical exercise is going to be part of being open to the Spirit of God, and is so is a good diet as well. Um, I'm, I want to make sure that I'm, um, I'm tending my mind, so, um, so having a, a creative and um, inquiring mind that's interested in the world and interested in things is all part of 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 choosing that which is life-giving and being open to God's spirit and then um, um, things like helping others and being open to others needs so that it isn't all focused on me but I'm actually looking outward to others and to the world in what way can I contribute to the well-being of those who who I come across in my life, or indeed those who I live amongst or in the nation that I dwell in. There is this symbiotic relationship that we have. We are not alone, however much we might feel alone. And, and therefore, what contribution can I make to, to the community, to the, um, to the situation, the environment in, in which I live? Now, next on my checklist, after giving time to that which is life-giving to me. The next thing on my checklist is my attitudes. For various reasons, we, well, most of us have the propensity to give ourselves over to really unhelpful attitudes that are, are like the glare of a too hot sun or drenching ourselves and becoming waterlogged in too much water um, to a seed. It'll kill the growth if we if we let it, and therefore, um, as part of of a, of a mindful approach to a spiritual growth, I I often find that that I have to really attend to the rooting out of the weeds of cynicism and bitterness, the kind of resentment which can kill growth, and and positively to encourage. Um, attitudes of like attitudes of generosity and thankfulness that that actually part of my my spiritual discipline is to try to be thankful and to articulate thankfulness both in prayer but also um, in everyday things as well last week father john thomason gave us some really good advice about how we can come to Jesus and and find rest in him and and um, and one of the things that he was talking about was the beauty of the world and not just to get past the immediate response of all that's nice to a real sense of recognition of the glorious beauty and the creativity of God in the world 
and to take those moments to stop and be truly thankful in our hearts. We can do that with beauty, but we can also do that for people or events. And to, to ensure that we nurture good and positive attitudes and weed out some of the, the destructive ones is also part, all part, of creating the right environment in which the seed of the word of God can grow. Now the next thing um, on my checklist is, is what I think of as culture. It, it is linked to attitudes and time, um, but it's on a, on a much wider scale. It's the, it's the sort of the, the intellectual and emotional environment that, I, that I'm actually living in all the time. And um, that, can be, that can be quite wide um, in the sense that it would include, oh, I don't know, the things that I read, the things that I spend my time doing, the movies I watch, the pastimes I give myself over to, the people that I live with, and the kind of culture which, which those things produce. Is it a life-giving culture or a life-draining culture? Um, I've known families of, of, of Christians who are very religious, they go to church, they do religious things, but you visit their home and the atmosphere is cutting and biting. They laugh a lot, but usually what they're doing is, is laughing at each other and cutting one another down in snipey kind of comments and, and the, the tension is palpable. Everybody laughs, but it's brittle. Um, it's, it's those kinds of hidden things that have to be watched, that the culture needs to be a nurturing cult culture, one that builds up, not one that tears down. And, and some of those, those, those cultural things are learned behaviour, and, and, and we don't sometimes notice that they are destructive rather than creative and life-giving. So that needs to be reflected on. What is the attitude of the people with whom you live? What's the attitude of your home or your working environment? Working environments, if you are still working, um, are really important to watch because to be subsumed into a culture um, which, uh, which is negative and which is destructive would is so easy to go along with if that's the culture that already exists and it's quite a difficult thing to set your face against that and be different but it is possible um, and uh, not just that though that the wider culture um, what kind of newspaper do you read what kind of programs do you listen to what are your political views like what are the political views like of the people that you talk with politics about, that uh, the people who agree with you. Um, again, how does it make you feel? Does it build you up? Do you see things with hopefulness and with compassion? Or are you really critical? And uh, um, or does it does it does it make you feel arrogant and sure of yourself and 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 very, very critical of others. How are those attitudes doing? These are the more sort of subtle um, um, things to watch out for. The, the effect, as it were, almost third hand of the culture that we are existing in, and sometimes have to be really noticed and tackled. And sometimes there are people in our lives that actually drag us down. And we, you know, there, there are some people and some groups of people that we just really just don't need to be with. Who is it that is life-giving in your life? Are there people or pastimes or things that you do which actually, on reflection, mean that you aren't growing as spiritually in the way that you could? Does there have to be some kind of adjustment in the prioritisation that you have and of the culture with which you surround yourself? Um, these things are worth thinking about and worth reflecting on and deeply pondering. 
to see if there are any adjustments that can be made and should be made and do need to be made in order always this is the point not to stop things just because they're wrong or to do things because it's right but always to be asking what is life-giving for me what will help me grow what will help me be fruitful what is it that drags me down what is it that means that I die a little how can I avoid those things and how can I how can I encourage the things which help me grow and be fruitful and become more of the true person that I really am that God has made me to be all of this is part of creating the right soil for the word of God to do its job to unleash the power of God's presence and life and potential for us within ourselves. To finish, let's take another look at one of those time-lapse films again. And let's pray that God will be this fruitful in our own lives. Amen. <laughs> 